Uh, resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Thornhill. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, I welcome uh, this opportunity to participate in uh, uh, this important debate today. Uh, recent polls, Mr. Speaker, have shown us that uh, national security and the fight against jihadi terrorism, and I, I regret that uh, so many of my honourable colleagues on the other side of the House refuse to use that modifier to uh, to describe this uh, new and very, uh, very dangerous uh, form of terrorism. They refuse uh, uh, to recognize this as, as one of the most important issues facing Canadians from coast to coast. I can tell you, uh, certainly, Mr. Speaker, that uh, my constituents in Thornhill, the vast majority of my constituents in Thornhill, uh, share that concern. I've received any number of phone calls uh, uh, over recent months from folks who want to know precisely what we're doing to keep our communities safe from jihadi terrorists. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to respond to each and every one of those phone calls to explain uh, the, uh, the content of the uh, bill that is before us today, the Anti-Terrorism Act 2015. That's because uh, it gives me an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to highlight the strong record uh, of this Conservative government. First, we uh, tabled the Economic Action Plan 2015, which invests nearly $300 million in the fight against jihadi terrorism. This is uh, above and beyond the fact that we've increased the resources available to our national security agencies by one-third since coming to office. We've listed dozens of new groups as terrorist entities to prohibit them from operating, from recruiting, from fundraising, uh, simply, uh, in short, from doing business in Canada. These include the uh, Islamic State, Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Shabaab, uh, and, of course, al-Qaeda. We passed the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act to allow the families of those who have been killed in terrorist acts to seek compensation from state sponsors of terror. We passed the Combating Terrorism Act to give new tools to stop individuals from traveling overseas to engage in terrorism. We passed the Protection of Canada from Terrorists Act to modernize, modernize the tools available to CSIS uh, when investigating threats to Canada. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, we introduced the bill, which is be, uh, before us here today, uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act 2015. This bill, and I'll remind the House, will do four key things. Uh, it will create a system uh, for internal government information sharing. It will improve the Passenger Protect Program, colloquially known as the uh, no-fly list. It will criminalize the dissemination of terrorist literature and propaganda. And it will give CSIS the ability to disrupt planned terrorist attacks before they happen. Mr. Speaker, these measures are just good old-fashioned common sense. It makes no sense that the right hand of government should be prohibited from knowing what the left hand is doing. That's why we are eliminating the silos and the roadblocks that potentially act as roadblocks to the safety of Canadians. It makes no sense that individuals whom we suspect may be traveling abroad to engage in terrorism would be allowed to board an aeroplane. It makes no sense that we allow terrorist recruiters to post propaganda online with impunity. It makes no sense that we would prohibit our national security officials from taking action to foil a terrorist plot. That's why we're moving forward with this legislation, Mr. Speaker. It simply makes good common sense. But as the old saying goes, common sense is not always all that common. The NDP member for Boharnwa Salaberry said Bill C-51 will only increase the disproportionate representation of Aboriginals in our prisons. Well, this is, this is ridiculous, Mr. Speaker, and let me be clear. The bill is targeted at terrorists. It is not targeted at protesters or environmentalists or whatever other voter bloc the NDP wants to confect. To fearmonger by suggesting that this legislation will somehow lead to the incarceration of Aboriginals is simply irresponsible. Any individual who is not engaging in terrorist activities or distributing jihadi propaganda 
will be able to continue to go about their daily lives without feeling the slightest impact of this legislation. And don't just uh, take my word for it, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as former Supreme Court Justice John Major uh, had this to say, he said, citizens who are not validly under suspicion will not have some manufactured reason for their private lives to be interfered with. Mr. Speaker, going even a step further, Ray Boisvert, a, a former uh, senior official at CESA, said anybody who had an issue they would like to protest, who thinks they will now become a target of the security establishment, I think you should not flatter yourself to this degree. The fundamental fact, Mr. Speaker, is that we are taking action to prevent Canadians from being targeted by jihadi terrorists. Not long ago, barely six months ago now, uh, we suffered two terrorist attacks on our own soil. We lost two brave members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Mr. Speaker, we must never forget those attacks, particularly in the context of discussing the modernization of our national security legislation. While the NDP and the Liberals put their collective heads in the sand and wished that national security was not an issue that we're faced with, our Conservative government will continue to make the tough decisions. While the NDP leader has um, fantasized uh, any number of times uh, of conspiracy theories, uh, most notably uh, uh, about the, uh, his skepticism over the death of uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, while the leader of the official opposition has refused to accept that Canada has in fact been attacked by terrorists, our Conservative government, Mr. Speaker, will continue to make the tough decision. And while the uh, Liberal leader uh, makes juvenile one-liners about uh, whipping out CF-18s, our Conservative government will, Mr. Speaker, continue to make the tough decision. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is that Canadians know they can only count on the Conservative government to make the tough decisions to keep Canadians safe from terrorist, to terrorist threats, from specifically jihadi threats. Mr. Speaker, as my time begins to uh, draw to a close, I'm reminded of comments made at the Public Safety Committee by Louise Vincent, the uh, sister of Warrant Officer Patrice Vincent, who was killed in cold blood by a jihadi terrorist. She said, if C-51 had been in place on October 19th, Martin Couture Rouleau would have been in prison, and my brother would not be dead today. Mr. Speaker, when I vote on this important legislation, I will be keeping those words in mind. I hope my NDP, my Liberal, and other opposition colleagues will do the same. Thank you. Question and comment. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for. Longueuil, Pierre Boucher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I sympathize as much as he does with the story of Corporal Vincent's family. We all do on this side of the house. But if I were as insulting as the many examples the member just threw out over the past uh, 10 minutes, it wouldn't be a pretty sight. I'd like to remind the member that this way of saying that they're tough on crime and that they're making the tough decisions, are they not just trying to look tough? Is that why they refused all amendments put forward by whomsoever in this House? Are they just trying to play to a certain constituency to look tough, or is there any real good reason for that, the Honourable Member? I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, Mr. Speaker. Clear, and uh, and we have heard any number of times during uh, the debate today and in uh, previous days of debate in this House uh, that, in fact, our government listened very closely uh, to the spectrum of witnesses that came uh, before uh, before the committee, uh, and we have, uh, in listening to uh, to those concerns, uh, responding uh, with a number of. Uh, with a number of, uh, of amendments, but in listening as well to the, to the expert advice 
that in fact uh, this new phenomenon of uh, jihadi terrorism uh, requires uh, new abilities uh, within uh, the secu security agencies uh, of our country. And this, this bill provides, uh, I am convinced, uh, our government is convinced, a balance between uh, recognizing and protecting essential uh, Canadian rights, but also ensuring uh, the security of our country uh, against these new threats of terrorism. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I just wanted to, again, just take the, the opportunity to talk about or maybe pose the, the question in regards to the loss uh, of the government's uh, ability to be able to take uh, parliamentary oversight uh, and incorporate it into uh, the legislation. And that is somewhat sad, I would suggest to you, Mr. Speaker, given uh, that other uh, countries, uh, Canada's allies, uh, in particular the Five Eyes, um, have already have parliamentary oversight. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the uh, member from Mount Royal, uh, when he, while he was the Liberal Minister of uh, Justice, from what I understand, brought in legislation that was in fact being uh, supported in which the current Minister uh, of Justice actually uh, supported parliamentary oversight. And, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that the, this legislation could have been far much better had the government just simply adopted what it seems everyone uh, in uh, everyone of the stakeholders, uh, the people that came before committee acknowledged, and that was the need for more uh, oversight. And uh, maybe if the member can provide some comment as to why uh, he believes uh, that uh, oversight in, t in the terms of parliamentary oversight was just not warranted uh, or provided for in this bill when so many people wanted to see it. Good question. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague uh, for, uh, for a very thoughtful uh, and reasonable question. Um, as we've explained in this House any number of times, we believe that uh, third-party, non-partisan, independent uh, expert oversight of our national uh, security uh, agencies is a better model uh, than, um, than uh, political intervention in the process. And I would just offer, uh, he has quoted, as he has uh, any number of times in this debate, uh, some of our Five uh, Eyes partners. And I would uh, remind him of something said recently by the formal legal chief of uh, uh, Military Intelligence Section 5, Military Intelligence Section 6, MI5, MI6, as it's uh, popularly known, uh, who said that... Uh, in fact, judicial oversight is something which is lacking in, uh, in the British system. Uh, and at the time, uh, this uh, former uh, legal head of MI5, MI6 uh, praised the French system because it does have exactly that uh, and said that uh, it removes the non-expert uh, political uh, uh, contamination of some national security cases and in fact uh, provides uh, through the, uh, the expertise uh, and the knowledge uh, and maturity of a, uh, of a judge, uh, the right to balance the, uh, the interests of, uh, of, uh, of uh, national rights, human rights, civil rights, and, uh, and security issues. Uh,